Hello, everyone. Welcome to Mind Pump. In the first half of this episode, we talk about four novel lifting techniques that will get your body to respond as well as other topics. In the second half of the show, the guys coach four live callers on questions such as, I'm going on vacation. How can I avoid losing my gains? I like to snowboard and wakeboard. What is the best way for me to work out? I'm having a hard time moving from a split routine to a full body workout. What do you suggest to make the mental leap? And my legs are a lot bigger than my upper body. How can I achieve balance between the two? Finally, we have another channel. It's called Mind Pump Clips. We are posting up a lot of videos there. These are videos taken from this show. They're short clips, easy to watch and easy to share. Go over there, Mind Pump Clips, and subscribe. All right, enjoy the show. Here are four novel ways to get a body part to respond when you do strength training. Here they are. Let's say you're doing 12 sets for a body part. Here's four different ways you can do that. Option one. Four exercises for that body part, three sets each. Option two, three exercises for that body part, four sets each. Option three, two exercises, six sets each. And option four, do one exercise for 12 sets. All of them are different. All of them provide different value, but all of them build muscle. I, uh, Way to go, math the, guy. The yeah, magical yeah. number 12. <laughs> I, was like, I, was I know he wrote that down and rehearsed it like five times. <laughs> <laughs> so one and 12. Let me like give three my math. I'm not that bad at math. <laughs> no, you know, do, do you guys remember when you figured this out where you didn't have to do, like you could do the same amount of sets, but do like one exercise yeah. or just two? Like they're all, um, they're all valuable, especially when they're novel. Like if you always, because I, I did a uh, tweet on this and people are like, well, isn't it better to do more exercises and, I said, well, you know, generally, yes, but if that's what you always do, I said, try going to the gym on chest day or shoulder day, pick a big gross motor movement and do just all your sets with that one movement and watch what happens. Watch how you feel. It'll, it'll blow you away. Yeah. Yeah. How often do you guys change this up? Like, were you, I, this was one of those things that, you know, we talk about how like, oh, you shifted something in your, your training or thinking around, you know, programming that like made this huge leap for your gains or whatever. This was one of them where I, for the longest time, I was three sets, yes you know, three sets of whatever exercise. And well, cause I, it's promoted as like the best muscle building, like zone was like three, yeah, sets. three to four, yeah. right? Three to four sets was like the standard for hypertrophy training. And so that was the area I was stuck. I actually remember just. This way, and this was before I even really started to track volume or any of this stuff. I trained in the three set thing forever, and it was again. I think somebody who gave me that advice asked me another, an actually good trainer uh, who I was talking to was just like, "Well, have you ever organized it to where you have four? You do four sets of everything?" And I'm like, "No, I've never thought of that." <laughs> <laughs> and I remember doing that this and alchemy. like seeing huge gains. You know, that was actually for the first transition of going like, oh, "Okay, well, this is you know, all I did was really increase the volume." And then also recognizing that, oh man, I can do just like what you said, three sets, four sets. I could do six yeah. sets, like, you know, and we can start to play with that a little bit. I do that all the time. Yeah, now. And you can keep the volume, like you could keep the total sets the same. So it's not like, you, you know, you did four sets. Now you're doing a bunch more sets. Mm -hmm. you, you cut out an exercise or do less of other exercises. The first time I, I figured this out, I was reading about uh, Paul Anderson. He's one of the, the strongest athletes of all time. He's an Olympic weightlifter, American. He's like one of the most decorated American Olympic lifters. And I was reading about how he would, he, you know, had a farmhouse and he would go and do squats and he would do like 15 sets of just squats. I said, God, you know, I've never done a workout. Like I always do the same thing. I would do three sets of this exercise, three sets of that exercise. And I said, why don't, instead of doing, you know, three or four exercises for chest, what if I just did bench press and I just did all the sets, just mm -hmm. did all the sets of just bench press. And I remember the pump I got, how I felt my strength gains. I was like, oh, it was like, it was like paradigm shattering. I said, oh my God, I could do this for any exercise, any body part. It doesn't, by the way, it doesn't have to be a compound gross motor movement either. You could do 12 sets of laterals, you know, yeah. um, it, it, obviously that's not going to be as uh, loud of a signal, but my point with this is you can have that flexibility and it's one way to change your workout, make it novel. So you're going in to do X amount of sets. You can still do those sets. You could do, in fact, you can even go as crazy as doing 
one set of 12 exercises. Well, that's what I was just going to bring up. That I, It wasn't 12, but it was 10. And I remember doing that with uh, a buddy of mine in college. And it was like, well, let's let's try this out. We had heard it from somewhere. I don't know, like a power lifter or somebody that was talking to us about, you know, like structuring it that way. And they're like, well, let's try this and let's see. You know, of course, we're like, you know, picking a weight that's like pretty close to our like max rep. Oh, yeah, you got to change Because it's like, oh, it's only one rep, right? Mm -hmm. and, and then- Oh my God, it just buried us. Like it was insane. But then like I, I did it again in a, in a, in a better way in terms of like, like shaving down quite a bit of like more like 70% of, of, you know, intensity. And it was so much better. And it actually got a lot better. My, my performance like increased because of the, the rest in between. And then the approach to it was totally different. Yeah. That's something else too, to consider too. If you do something like this and you're doing all your sets with one exercise, consider that by the 10th set, you have to be able to perform the reps that you're looking for. Yeah. So if you normally do three sets of bench press with X amount of pounds, you're going to have to go a lot lighter if you plan on doing 10 sets of that exercise. Well, especially if you never do it, like you, I think that's, I, that's a mistake I make a lot, right? Yeah. When I, when I do these, you know, interrupt my training to with a, you know, 10 set day, like the GBT type of training. And I just, you know, and, and typical training or programming for me is like somewhere between the, you know, three to maybe five or six set ranges where I, so jumping all the way to 10 or 12, you really, uh, uh overestimate what you, you can oh, do, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Cause you're, and it's a, it's amazing how adapted the body gets to these amount of sets. Mm -hmm. Like and that always is such a reminder to me. It's just like. I don't think I'm that much weaker, but I'm so used to stopping it like yeah. set five and then I don't have to do it anymore that when I push six, seven, eight sets and something like that, I get dramatically but weaker. But this always for me just highlights such that different mindset going into these different structures. Like, like it's just so, it was so different for me to just get in and like, you know, you kind of get into the groove when you get more of a, um, a lot more reps, like you're, you're able to kind of like work your way into, to the rep in a sense versus like, I really had to like laser focus and then get ready and then perform, you know, for just that one rep. So it was oh, you talking about different... doing 10 singles or whatever? Yeah. Oh yeah. I love that. Yeah. I it was love that. such a different mindset. Yeah. It's so awesome. So what, how, uh, okay. You didn't say, uh, 12 sets of, or, I mean, 12 exercises of one set. You could do that too. You could, but would you make the case? I would make the case that that is, I think anything under two and even two is pushing it. I know in some of our, our you would have to stuff, be, we go two sets. Yeah. But I, you would have to be pretty yeah, like advanced to the point where you could get into the groove with one set. A lot of people need to do one set before they can do another. Well, set. I would make this case though. I'd actually say it's the two extremes. Either you'd have to be very advanced or so new that just touching, a, a, yeah. you know what I'm saying, that you get s stimulus yeah. and, and change from that, right? So I feel like the two ends of the spectrum could get away with one set of an exercise, one or two sets of an exercise, because what, if you're a, extremely brand new and a squat or anything, one set of them, and there's a good yeah. chance that you'll you'll get sore and you'll feel that even if they if they aren't the most effect, done effectively, right? Then the other in the extreme, uh, if you're really really advanced and you can you've already maybe primed your body and you can get connected really well maybe you can get some benefit the other challenge is like most people can't think of 12 exercises for a body <laughs> part you know what i mean yeah dude. like 12 shoulder exercises yeah. like you know what i mean yeah, yeah, yeah unless you're a trainer that'd be pretty tough for somebody to, i don't yeah. like personally i don't like going less than three and again i know that in our yeah. pre-phase we do two sets that obviously for the thought process behind that is a brand new person that's a total mm -hmm. exception of the rule uh but I, even with my priming, I still feel like I want about one set to really get in the groove. Isolation so, movements, I could do less because those are pretty easy to jump. That's into. a good point. You know, like a cable movement or a, you know. That's a good uh, point. Yeah, the compound stuff. I agree with you. Same thing, but you know, that's personal preference. But my point is that I think we we get. I did the same. We all did this. You get stuck in your pattern, and you think change exercises, change reps, um, you know, maybe change total volume, but nobody thinks that they could go in and do less sets, more exercises or less exercises and more sets and hit the same volume. Mm -hmm. That's something that most people don't think about. This is why you brought up GVT, which is German volume training, where they'll tell you to do 10 sets of 10 reps of an exercise or 10 sets of five reps of an exercise. This is why when people switch over to it, it they get such crazy gains yeah. because it's so radically different from what they're used to that it's so novel. So you're advanced, you've been working out for three, four years, and you've never done this before, try it and watch what happens. Your body all of a sudden responds. All right, everybody, today's free program giveaway is MAPS Strong. 
Here's how you can win that program. Leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Also, subscribe to this channel and then click on notifications. If we declare you the winner, we'll let, winner, we'll let you know in the comments section. Also, we've got three these three bundles on sale right now, but it's only going to be on sale for the next four days. After that, they are gone. Each bundle gives you up to nine months of planned workouts. Each bundle is $300 or more off. So again, it's a huge promotion. If you're interested, just click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, here comes the show. All right, so I'm going to go, at, you know, at the risk of Adam uh, going off onto a tangent because uh -oh. I know the AI conversation has been <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so far we haven't got any complaint, or at least I haven't got a complaint yet. It, Most people seem to be interested. So that well, I think good. we're all, yeah, dude, it's a big shift. You know, I'm sure yeah. people are all speculating right now what's going to happen. Yeah, and yeah. to be fair, it's ta everybody's talking about it. Yeah. So I'm, I'm teasing yeah, yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We like to tease you, though. Dude, I just learned something about AI that is remarkable. I didn't even think of, and this is just highlights there's so much that we don't even consider, the, the possibilities that we don't even consider. So check this out. When pharmaceutical companies are creating new drugs to try to target a particular receptor or to treat a particular disorder or symptom, there's two main ways that they will test uh, a particular drug or new compound. There's what's called in vitro. And in vitro is in a Petri dish or a test tube. Okay, so vitro meaning glass. Mm -hmm. Then there's in vivo, which means it's in a living organism, so an animal. And then, of course, human testing. So in vivo, in vitro. Well, they have a way of testing now that AI is starting to make, uh, like, not just possible, but this is going to be how pharmaceutical companies are going to narrow down their pipeline. So I don't know. So let me back up for a second. A pipeline is pharmaceutical company gets their scientists together, and they come up with a hundred different concepts for different molecules and compounds that may target a particular receptor. And then through that, they have to pick the ones that they're going to test in vitro and that's expensive. And then through that, it narrows down. And so there's potentially thousands and thousands of possibilities that they never test because they're too risky. It's too expensive. And when you're a pharma company, the FDA process is, it's like a billion dollars to take th something from concept to market through all the, all the trials which means if you're a pharmaceutical company, let's say you're gonna make a pain drug and your options are an opiate, so a different type of opiate, and then this new radical different compound that is something we've never tried before. Unproven, yeah. You're not gonna you're, you're, you're not gonna take that risk because you're like, I'm not gonna spend you know hundreds of millions of dollars or billions of dollars on something that's probably gonna fail. Mm -hmm. Opiates, we know they work and whatever, so we're just gonna stick with this particular you know compound. Well, now they're doing what's called in silica. So AI, uh, is able to now take a compound in the computer and test it through simulate the computer, it? simulate through the computer, like you're doing it in vitro or in vivo. What? So you guys remember, um, you, uh, you know, Iron Man, like when Iron Man was testing mm -hmm. like compounds and he's doing the thing with his hands and he's testing different things. That's what they were showing in there is that he's basically, his computer is testing compounds before he ever tests it in real life. AI is going to be able to do that now. So they're going to be able to go in have a target receptor or a protein or a pathway and say, we want to work with this pathway. We want to agonize this receptor, antagonize this receptor, affect this particular pathway, whatever. Here's all these different options. Here's 150 Based different- Based on all labs that they've been able to collect and record and then it just- They'll be able to take a molecule, points. change it in the computer, plug it in. How's that going to work? Oh, it doesn't work. Change it this way. Or the AI itself is going to say, Holy we're going to figure shit. out, a, you'll, you'll, sit, you'll put the molecule in, or the compound, and the AI itself will make it work for whatever target you're looking at. Then it'll spit out, here are five ways or five different compounds or molecules with a, according to our testing, 98% effective rate. Now the pharma company can take those out of thousands of options and test them in vitro and save tremendous amounts of money and just open up the doors for potential you know, drug discoveries. Just an immediate disruption. It's crazy. I don't think people realize just how that's, radical. That's such a and like you said, the barrier to entry. It's insane. The billions of dollars you have to pour in to test something. So it was that unlocks like all new potential for different compounds. We, we are, never would have thought of. We are on the verge of a breakthrough in biology and in medicine. That's wow. going to be. It's going to make antibiotics look like vitamins. 
It's yeah. going to blow our minds because because what's going to happen is once we accidentally ate mold, yay, like, yeah, <laughs> Nobel Prize, yeah, yeah. exactly, <laughs> accidents, yeah, they were all accidents. Yeah. So we're going to be able to put in a receptor, a pathway into the AI, and then say create five potential you know compounds that can affect whatever we're looking for. And show us the ones with over 95% accuracy that you think, whatever. And then it'll spit them out. They'll what be able to create the drugs. trip, dude. Whew. Saving it's too much. billions and billions and billions of dollars of development. Can we can we slow down? <laughs> so yeah. It's all this year. So wild, right? It's going to be this year. I mean, this yeah. year we're going to see, I think, when everybody kind of wakes completely up. Obviously, it is it is popular. A lot of people are talking about but there's still a lot of people that don't. When I did a post the other day, at least half of the messages I got were, what is that? Or... How do I do that? Or oh, what? Tell me more. Like, there's a lot of people that still are not, you know, privy to exactly what it's doing. I think unless you've gone on ChatGPT and play with it, I don't think you really can grasp the capabilities of it. And then also how to like, I'm still challenging myself on to think this way, right? Like, we have so many uh, habits of like how we would solve problems, you know, ourselves. Yeah that I'm trying to train myself every time I have- Ask a, better questions, right? Right. So, I mean, here's another one, right? So Katrina talking to me yesterday, she has interviews today and we're looking for somebody for the uh, apparel side of the business. And she's like, hey, when and she knows that for a, a, a long period of, of my career, a lot of it was spent doing interviews. And so, you know, I've learned some good things to ask in interviews for for getting, you know, out the character of the person and stuff like that. And so she's, Hey, could you sit down with me and help me uh, prepare for some of these interviews that I'm going to do? And I said, have you thought about using chat GBT? And she's like, how would I use that for an interview? I'm like, okay, well prompt it first to ask, what are the best characteristics for somebody to have an apparel business? Or what are the <laughs> best characteristics for a, a What are the success? questions I should ask somebody? Right. And then after it gives you the characteristics <laughs> up. of what makes a successful apparel line or whatever like that, then ask how to ask questions to get those answers from somebody and then ask it to limit you to 10 questions or whatever, the top 10 questions to ask for those characteristics. And now you have basically an interview. In for 10 seconds. Them. And yeah, just instantly. Wow. And I'm like- now I have the ability because I've been doing it for a long time to probably sit down with you for an hour and formulate that. But I mean, you could literally prompt Chat GPT with maybe two or three different unique prompts and get a a better probably wow. interview than I would probably give yeah, you. At least maybe. a baseline, then you can. I mean, so, add to it or subtract. So that's what I mean. I mean, that's it. Just is learning to to think like that. Like you know how. So I've really tried to be you know, cognizant of that as, as we go through the day now, when there's like little things, it's like, okay, well, how, yeah, I'm going to, I would go search or read mm -hmm. or reach out to someone out. Well, what if I prompt chat GPT to get to the bottom of it? Well, I and, just, yeah, just so, productivity. Yeah. It makes perfect sense. I just read an article. So you guys know what the singularity is. Well, in physics, the singularity is like when you pass what's known as the event horizon in a black hole where you, you go past the event horizon and the, and the singularity is the point of the black hole where the gravity is so strong, nothing can escape or whatever. But they've taken that term and used it for AI. And I think it was Ray Kurzweil who came up with mm -hmm. it first. And the singularity with technology is when AI gets it's so intelligent that it can create AI smarter than itself. And they call that the singularity mm -hmm. because there's no turning back. At that point, AI will evolve so rapidly that we will be left in the dust. Once it can design things smarter than itself, Mm -hmm. And then that can design things smarter than itself. Then we're screwed. Then that's it. We don't do anything anymore. And I, so there's this organization in Rome, this, uh, I think it's a university if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and the, the, that's what these scientists do is they, they come up with ways to figure out when would this potential singularity happen? Mm -hmm. Well, they just came up with a number seven years. <laughs> they think that in seven years that, that their best calculation is within seven years, we will reach the singularity with AI technology. Isn't that wild? I liked when it was like 25 years old. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I had a little bit of like chill about it, man. But it does seem like that. It, everything's moving so quickly. I That's now, not that far of a, a speculation. Now, when you guys sit and like ponder on this, as I, I'm sure we all do think about this outside of here, uh, 
do you do you do you go more the optimistic or pessimistic view of it? Like, do you do you naturally gravitate and go like, man, you start thinking of all the like negative things or all the things that boy, this could be dangerous and lead this way, or do you have more of the attitude like, wow, this is going to be really interesting? All the things it's going well, to solve and fix and help. Unfortunately, I kind of go to well, what? you're the antichrist believer of the yeah, AI, yeah, yeah. so I know where you go. Well, <laughs> you go <laughs> because I pay attention to history, so yeah. there's um, civilizations hit a peak. And um, this is a peak like that we're facing. So I don't know a civilization that survived once we've hit this kind of a monumental shift. Uh, and so I, it makes, it scares the hell out of me to be honest yeah. with you. But I, I think that um, it, you're going to have, I'm, I'm going to have to listen to somebody that can sell me on all of the benefits to it, like long-term uh, to really kind of like pull me out of that dark place. Yeah. I go, I can flip or flop back and forth depending on my mood. So on the, on the positive side, I'm like, okay, we now have, we're pretty close to having the potential to solve all of our biggest challenges like energy travel, food, uh, productivity, efficiency, you know, that kind of stuff. And then the other side, and this is more recent, is that I, I can get negative with the, I guess, the philosophical, moral question, which is if, you know, if every person has the ability to get everything they want, if every person could walk around with a genie, like imagine if every human had a genie right now, like that would be a disaster. Like what would that be like? And at, at, at best, we're going to be challenged with things that we don't even, we can't even fully comprehend. Like for example, Elon Musk just did a, he did a post a couple of days ago where he said like two of the most, I don't remember what the other one was, but one of them was like, like two of the worst curses. One would be to live forever. And people were debating him. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, no, that would be a curse. Like the, lots of meaning is provided because life is finite. Mm -hmm. We, we humans have never lived forever. And I think we don't, I don't think we can even conceptualize what challenge that would place on us if we lived forever. If we could just live forever, what would that do to us? It would be a, it would be a, a philosophical, um, boy, would that be a challenge uh, for us? Yeah. I think, I think in terms of like, it, it depends on the person you're, you're speaking to as well and like where they are in their journey and their life. Like, so if, if there's like a paycheck to paycheck, there's a lot of like crazy struggle, like this could be like a, a godsend. You know, like the future in terms of like uh, alleviating them of like this, this constant grind and, and being on uh, the hamster wheel of like trying to make it work, you know, like this is going to help uh, resolve like, like a lot of people's, um, um, who are like in, in the trenches in terms of like trying to, to make sense yeah. out of like purpose and like making, but at the, again, to like thinking long term, I just, I feel like we're going to lose sense of our own uh, purpose, our own drive, our own will to uh, make sense out of why we're here. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you got to think that you, the, the fact that you can walk in and switch on a heater or turn a flight switch and my fireplace comes on or yeah. I can have somebody else fix my plumbing when it goes. I mean, there, you have to, and you got to think that there's, there is a, a, a scary bad side to all of those even simple things that yes. you've just adapted to too, yes. right? Like mm -hmm. if, if I had to build my home, I would be fucked, right? Mm -hmm. If I was out and if I had to go hunt for my food, I would be fucked there. And I, and we've just let go of those skills. And so if you were to travel back, you know, thousands of years and, and say, this is what I'm going to, you're not gonna be able to do a start a fire. I'm not going to be able to build a home. Yeah. I'm not gonna be able to hunt food. They'd be like, Oh, you'd be, you're going to be decimated or you're never going to, you're never going to survive. Yeah. You'll never live. So I always try and put myself into that frame too, that, okay, that's how I see it right now. Cause it seems like, how could we give up the skill of critical thinking and learning and reading and stuff like that? I mean, audio books came out. I'm sure there was a, a fear of like, Oh my God, yeah. we're going to we're going to lose how to read because these books just re are read to you now. No, like, you're making a good point. Yeah. I think anytime we think of something radically changing, it sounds scary because we don't know what to anticipate. But I don't know. I think historically, whenever we've solved one problem, there's just other problems on the other end of it. Like we solved food in modern societies and now we mm -hmm. have obesity. Yeah. So not saying one is better than the other. Um, no, you're right. Yeah, we'll be both. It'd just be a little more on the extremes of like, you know, pure um, uh, euphoria and, and, and pure hell. 
you know, uh, I, I just see it like uh, in terms of like, um, you know, things that, that um, we're going to be challenged with a whole new thing that we probably didn't even uh, consider. And so, you know, there'll be there'll be some people that will really take advantage of it. And there'll be some people that will just be completely decimated by it. Yeah, I, I, I that's how I think. That's I Adam's think, plugged and plugged in. Isn't yeah, it? no, yeah. I definitely I think we're going to it's going to be like that. But I, I, I definitely think that there's going to be it's going to solve some more problems than i mean think about how crazy the internet was like how many problems that solved and how many things it made better but right. then look at all the things that we're seeing now with yeah. kids and and pornography and like there's there's a lot of really bad dark sides of the internet and yeah. what so that's exactly what's going to happen with this i feel like it's going to maybe arguably solve more problems and make more things in life better than maybe anything that we've seen in our yeah. lifetime. But at the same, t in the same token yeah. or same breath, in, in terms of struggle, it will create new problems that we never even knew would probably well, here's, exist. Here's the the positive side of, that I'll, I'll say. Maybe it does, maybe it pushes humanity to progress uh, psychologically, philosophically, you know, in a, in a philosophical way and spiritually because we will reach a point where we're going to get everything that we want. Yeah. So what? why am I saying this? Because if we get everything that we want and we're left sad and anxious and depressed, then maybe then people will start to look in that direction. Okay, well, we got everything and I'm still mm. feeling this way. So it might do that, right? It might just drive us now, towards I, okay, positive so, progress. So I, I, I agree. Now that that's the one pessimistic or scary thing that I see, and that's just because we will. It'll be our lifetime and probably our kids' lifetime. They'll have to go through the shit for us to look back yeah, on history yeah, and yeah. go like, remember when we thought yeah. we wanted everything? Like we're. It's not going to happen quick. That's not going to happen quick. I mean, it's going to be... Yeah, we don't learn fast like AI does. No, yeah. no. I mean, <laughs> it, uh, it, it took, you know, uh, almost 30 years of my life of chasing this this dollar amount that I thought was going to make me happy. And then when I got there, uh, it doesn't matter what how how brilliant of a person could sat me down yeah. and, and said, listen, it's you're going to realize that this is not... A, it, no, fuck you. I need to find out for myself. Oh, and then justifying, I'm, look at my life. It's so amazing. I'm having such a good time. So, you know, to me, that's a, a, a small example of what our entire society is going to have to go through yeah. for probably decades before we can then reflect on it and go, unless, remember when we thought we wanted everything. Unless the AI can simulate and teach you that well, can simulate it. Right. Hey, if we go on this path, what's it going to look like in 25 years? And then it spits it out. Now we well, would have to accept it and be like, okay, I think that's, we're going to believe this. So, I mean, I don't know. I it's, think, it's so wide open, right? I think this is, this has been one of those things that like philosophers and people have been trying to kind of anticipate because like the whole argument of, free, do we even have free will? Right. Or is it all predestined? Yeah. It's like, we're getting so close to that point where, we may actually lose all free will if we completely abandon, uh, you know, our own autonomy in terms of like the way that we cognitively uh, rationalize thing and think our own way through it versus like dependency on a machine. You know, what's weird about this is that old wisdom is so it just never goes away. Oh, it's so applicable. Like the like the e eating the apple in the Garden of Eden, right? That story, right, of knowledge, right, and then what that created. Pandora's box, the story of Pandora's box, opening it up for this, all the knowledge. And then mm -hmm. it's, Oh, we can't close it now. And we're totally screwed. Yep. It's just so funny how like they've known this for thousands of years. We've talked about this and the dangers yep, or, or the potential dangers, I should say. And, and yet here we are. That's yeah, pretty, but pretty it's crazy. coming. So yeah, pretty crazy. I know. <laughs> I'll get the popcorn you can't out. Stop it. Yeah. All right. Uh, Adam, I want to ask you about your move because, uh, <laughs> I know you've been, you've been moving and that's a pain uh, in the ass yeah. and you had to do all the moving yourself. We did. We, no, I shouldn't say we didn't do all of it ourselves. We, um, we contracted about a quarter of it out, all the heavy stuff, um, which was really funny to with the, Justin that, and I appreciate that. By that, the way, yeah, yeah, I didn't call you guys, call right? Yeah. That's a good friend. A good friend doesn't call another friend for a move. Yeah. That's why. That's why I'm going to start <laughs> that. ride to the airport. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good friends don't do that to other good yeah. friends. You know? So I didn't. I didn't call and bug you guys. I'll tell you a funny story. Since uh, today we we this this episode's brought to you by Sleep Me, so this is a great a, a great commercial for them because. We we got all of our stuff. We're all situated, and uh, you know, got our our bed set up, got our sleep me uh, set up, and everything. And um, <laughs> and I always talk about how they they save marriages. Well, they could also cause a divorce in a marriage too, right? Because Katrina woke up like enraged at me because I didn't 
when I moved, I didn't like tag Did who's which. Oh, so her side and was yours. And we didn't have we didn't have Wi Fi, so Oops. I couldn't go in and, and change it. So she wakes up at like Freezing. five o'clock in the morning, like <laughs> shivering cold. Like I got your Uller. She's like so pissed, and I was over there hot though, sweating because of hers. I was all pissed off, so I didn't even think about it. Didn't even dawn on me like that I might have. Yeah, head. I might have flip flopped him on accident. Isn't that funny how individual that is? <laughs> Yeah, like yeah. Like freezing for you, sleep good. Yeah, yeah. Hot for her, sleep good. Oh, Flip yeah. them and then you're yeah, She woke up all she woke up shaking me up, waking all mad at me, so like that. I've got your ruler. It's freezing <laughs> over so here. So what'd you guys yeah. do? Just switch sides in the back? Uh, I haven't even switched it. That just happened. It literally just yeah. happened. And so I but we we get Wi Fi handled, so I'll be able to go in. And, and you have you messed with the feature where it warms up towards the morning to wake you up? Yeah. Isn't so that, that that's so that's how mine is set. Mine is set to you get into bed. And it gets really, really cool. And now the reason why we didn't know this was because we had plugged them in that night. Oh, so, so it didn't get it didn't get time. It to, just started getting like two yeah, hours. Yeah, yeah. So bed. it kicked on, and so we didn't we didn't really know what either side was going to produce until long. We'd already fallen asleep, right? But mine's mine's set to get the coolest setting, and I set it to normally two hours before when I have Wi Fi to, to to control of it. I have it set to kick on. I'm really cold, and then at like I think I have it at five in the morning. 5.30 or so, it starts to slowly warm up and then hits its peak to where it's like hot. It just wakes you up normally. Yeah, if I'm not if I'm not out of bed by 6.30, my bed's like, it will make me wake up. It'll mm -hmm. be so so warm inside it's there. It's so cool because it simulates how we evolved to wake up mm. with the getting warm. You know, I try, you know, Katrina listens to the show and she knows that and she, I know she's heard us tout all the health benefits of sleeping cold and that she still ignores all that and she sleeps hot the whole way through. And I'm just like, how do you do that? Do She's it. like, because I don't yeah. feel hot. I'm like, I don't know how you don't feel hot. It's like 90 on your side. Wow. So, yeah. Hey, yeah. so so I just read, uh, I just posted this too on, on, on Twitter. There was a Rasmussen report. You guys know what Rasmussen is? Rasmussen? Okay, so this is a, a polling company and they do polls and they're, I mean, they're, you know, people respect them. They do polls for like elections, who's going to win, polls on what people think on, policy, what people think about certain things happening in the world. And I mean, they're so accurate that they'll influence Vegas odds and they'll, they'll influence politicians. Okay. So Rasmus Rasmussen posted on people who got the COVID vaccine, 7%. Okay. So 7% of people, according to Rasmussen, got side effects from the vaccine that were bad enough to have to go back to the doctor or the hospital and or to and or take time off work. Wow. Okay. So with that right there, now isn't, that's isn't that's, Sal, isn't the CDC right now launching a big old yeah, uh on strokes. Right? Yeah, potential yep. strokes. Okay. Like so, and, yeah. so we we're potentially gonna see a lot of stuff come out. Well, in the so next couple I, so months. so based on that data, and then add to that the data that would accept this is all accepted data. So that that seven percent isn't accepted. That's based off of a trusted poll source, but let's just put that aside. Add to that the data of how effective the vaccines are, how long they last in terms of their effectiveness, and whether or not they per they they prevent transmission, which they don't. And then you add to that the profit of these vaccines. What we have Good currently Lord. are simultaneously, this is wild when you think about it, we have simultaneously the, the most dangerous, based on these side effects, based off the Rasmussen poll, the mm -hmm. most dangerous, least effective, because mm -hmm. these vaccines will provide protection for like three months. They don't reduce, trans, they don't stop transmission. You still transmit it. Least effective and also simultaneously most profitable vaccines, I think of in history. Time. Of all time. I think in history. So most dangerous, least effective, most profitable this is insane. Yeah, and see, I was always promoting vaccines, but the one thing for me that, and this was not really that controversial for me in the beginning, it was just like, why is this protected from any investigation before it even was like mandated? I'm like, you know, to have this kind of like safe asylum uh, and, and, you know, no no real human trials. Like I didn't have enough time to adequately go through the normal process of being able to find these kind of side effects. And then it's just pushed through. That was enough of a red flag for me to wait. Yeah. And you were, and you were, in, you were not in a category of people where you were high risk. You don't have that's the other morbidities. Part, right. You're not old, you're healthy, you know, you know, blah, yeah. blah, blah. Again, I would consider it if I was unhealthy, if based, I was in that now, all, this, range. all this stuff coming out and, at least in my family, my circle of friends, stuff like that, 
I don't have anybody that's changing their tune still. I do. Oh, you do? I, yeah, I have I have some family members that got it, and they're like, I wish I didn't. Oh, okay. Because they See, were I healthy. Haven't, I haven't heard that. I've just, I've heard the doubling down. Like, I've had friends now that, like, yeah. they got, re- they've now finally got COVID once or twice, and they're like, oh, man, thank God I was vaccinated, because I probably would have died, because I was so sick yeah. when I got it. I'm just like, well, or maybe it would have been the same. Well, based on the current <laughs> data, if you're older and you have co- comorbidities, then there's a protective effect. If you're young and healthy, is, um, there seems to be a no net positive, and it's just based off of what I've read. Um, and in some cases, a net negative. If you look at this, is accepted data. So, but the part that blows me away is first off, just based off of what's accepted under normal circumstance. Obviously, we push these through very quickly, pandemic, right? Government's like, we need to get these through. But under normal circumstances, these th- this particular vaccines would have never passed trials. Never. Because the, 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 the standards for vaccines is so high, it's so high that you could have one or two, you could have like two or three cases of something happening amongst, you know, 50,000 test participants and they'll halt it. Yeah. So it would have never passed, but it's wild. It's wild that they're the most profitable on top of all this stuff. <clears throat> it's pretty wild. And this is, again, it's a Rasmussen poll, so it's not a scientific study. But if it comes out that 7% or even 5%, 2%, if 2% of people had side effects that were bad enough that they had to go to back to the doctor hospital, miss work type of deal, <clears throat> that sucks. That's a terrible, uh, that's terrible. Yeah. There, there's been some examples of, uh, you know, f- people, public figures and people kind of coming out and saying like, you know, admitting that, uh, you know, at this point it looks like it was, it was the wrong decision. Wasn't Scott it? Adams. Scott Adams. Yeah. yeah Scott yeah, Adams came out. He's like, the, the anti-vaxxers won. He said they won because he said when you when you don't trust people who don't trust the government and big business, especially when they're partnered, he says you almost always can't go wrong. And I agree. Historically, when they partner together, that's like the unholy right. reliance. Yeah. And um, you know, that's that's when you now I, I, you know, if you listen to our podcast and you listen back, you know, I was I was I'd be on the fence, I'd go back and forth, but I would look at the data, I'd consider my health, say, well, you know, I'm not in this category of people where I'm really high risk. Right. So I think I'll wait is yeah. what I, I kept saying. I think I'll wait. Just I think I'll advocating wait. advocating for our own, um, you know, thoughts and our own health. Like yeah. It's like, I gotta be my own advocate. Pretty, it's pretty wild. Have you guys, have you guys listened to, uh, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson talk about it with his, I heard him and Patrick Bet David. He, he has a fundamental misunderstanding of what freedom is. I'm talking about Neil, Neil, uh, deGrasse fundamental. He, his understanding, which is wrong, is that, you know, you are not free to get somebody sick. So you have to get that. First off, that's not how it works. You are free to take your own risks. Meaning in a world with diseases that are out there, me, I have the freedom to go out and to meet with people or talk with people or not. Also, if you own a business or a home, you should have the freedom to put a sign on your door that says you can't come in here unless you're vaccinated or you can't come to my house unless you're vaccinated or vice versa. That's freedom. Freedom is not go out and then, oh, uh, you know, you can't get me sick. Therefore, you're, you're, imp- you're, you're infringing on my freedom. No, no, no. You're free for yourself, not for other people. That's mm-hmm. how it works. He had a complete... He completely doesn't understand it. Yeah, I really, I thought, was for, so I, I was surprised that Patrick Bet David didn't go harder in that angle with him. He, they, he got more into a debate with him about the efficacy of the actual yeah. the vaccine and stuff like that. And if the process of how they do it. And so it turned into him defending, like, listen, this, it, where, where it's at now, it doesn't matter. We did it the best way we could have done it back then. And so they got into that argument back and forth where he didn't jump all over what he said about freedom. And I thought you're, I think you're right. I think that would have been the argument is just like, that's not what freedom is like you can't force somebody else to do that no. for, for the sake of your health and your family's health if you're that concerned stay in your fucking cave yeah, yeah. stay in your cave and, and hide with your family as, as you have the right yeah. to and, do a, and again to. if you own businesses and homes and your neighborhood and everybody decides this is what we want to do you should have the freedom to say nobody can come in here unless you're vaccinated or unvaccinated or whatever right that's how freedom works not so he, he had a fundamental misunderstanding of it and that, that annoyed the hell out of me you know but he made he did make good points it's like we didn't know during this period of time yeah we didn't know and we were pushing these things through and it was kind of scary and I get that so you know i'm not like hammering people during that period of time but now now yeah. uh yeah. like people who advocate for children to wear masks now and i say children because there is a medical protocol to wearing masks and if you don't have the right protocol it doesn't help if you touch it wrong and touch your face and don't use and use the same mask over and over again 
uh, then it doesn't work. So to force kids to wear masks, if you advocate for that now, you're an idiot. And I, I have no sympathy yep. for you. Now, adults, you can make your arguments or whatever, but I don't know. Do you know any adults that that handled masks according to medical protocol and didn't use the same one over and over again and didn't touch them? Like, no. you know, so, but with kids, if you advocate for kids, you know, third graders, like get, get out of here. You yeah. know, your, your fear is, uh, is harming children because you're a coward. Yeah, that's, yeah. My, that's my opinion. You know, speaking of of freedom, uh, you remind me of uh, you know the eye pencil thing. Okay, oh, yeah. that I've heard you talk about so many times. Yeah, Milton Friedman said that. Do you uh, know? Once. Did you know that's not Milton Friedman's? Yeah, I know. He quoted uh, someone else. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't know that. I've heard that so many times, and I know you 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 tell that story. It's actually from the fifties from a guy named Leonard Reed. It was an essay that he wrote. Yeah. I had no idea about. It's that. a whole essay on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was. I found. I, I don't know how I came across. Oh, you know what it was? I was reading this uh, Tuttle Twins ad. And went down the, the rabbit hole of all the books and stuff they stuff because for Max and everything. So I get hit with some of their stuff because I bought books for him. And I was just really interested. And then they start sharing the 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 pencil story. And they rewrote it, which then and uh, you know, attributed Milton Friedman, who then he said, like, well, then it really originally came yeah. from a guy named Leonard it Reed. It just really highlights how well like the like how markets encourage people to work together who've never met each other, don't have the same beliefs. And for anyone who's never seen Milton, it's a very short clip, it's like four minutes long, three minutes long. Anyone who hasn't seen it, maybe we'll, we'll attach it to this on YouTube. You can watch it, but it's uh, it's brilliant. It's the first video I saw of Milton Friedman, and then I became a huge fan of his and watched That it. was the first one? Very first one. I saw it on YouTube, and I'm like, what? And then I watched all his all his stuff, and it became a huge. <laughs> I read his books and everything. It was, it was, yeah, yeah, it was, that's great. It was pretty awesome. Was anyway, great. speaking of science and stuff, you know Caldera runs their own uh, tests on their skincare products? Oh, nice. And, and they're all uh, third party. I mean, they're all, you know, cross-referenced or whatever. 96% of people who use their skin. So 96% of men who use their skincare products uh, report getting better skin. 96%. And this is studies. Wow. These are studies that they actually wow. put together. So they do, they, they, that's a huge. Well, right? I, I think you the know, last massive. time we, the last time we had an ad for them, I think one of the things that I was pointing out of why it's done so well with our audience, it's one of those things that, you see the immediate return. I mean, that's like one of the things that is such a great selling point for any product. Like, you know, how many times have you bought something and it's like, oh, you know, oh, you got to take it for a while or wait till this. It's like, that's one of those things that you you use and then like instantly look in the mirror right and go away. like, oh, wow, that yeah. looks different and looks better. Like, and so I think that's why. Yeah, it, yeah it just builds more credibility when you actually use it. And it's just one of those, pro you have to like actually physically go through that process in order to really become like an, an avid, uh, uh, consumer of it. Yeah, yeah. totally. Do you guys, did you guys, have you been watching this power slap league that Dana White invested in? Yeah. I heard you. Okay. You made a comment about this. Uh, he you, jumped the shark. Uh, you said opinion. that. I don't know. You know, I don't know if I agree or not. Like, I don't know if I, I would consider that jumping the shark. I don't know, man. Have you watched it? I mean, I have, and I saw the guy, the guy who got really injured just recently, and it is the, guy, the one guy's face was like this big. On one I side prefer the house. ones where I saw these girls like just slap each other's butts instead. I, was like, <laughs> I support that one, <laughs> not this face like melting, like yeah. for me. Like I'm like, dude, he's ruined this guy's face. Dude. Yeah, I, so the there's thing. a butt slapping league. Yeah, that's, that's hilarious. Yeah, it's amazing. There's, that's some, there's something for everybody yeah. now, yeah. man. They're really. I is. don't know. I think Dana White jumped the shark, dude. It's I well, do what. It's okay. Do you know, do you even know how, maybe Doug could look this up for us. Like how invested is he? Like, I want to know how much like he's actually risking and like, is it really like a, cause I mean, he could be, he could be hardly leveraged at all to be in that. And he's just, you know, it's kind of like his partnership with UFC gyms. I mean, I think that's like, I doubt he's like the major controller of all the decisions. Maybe he's just got a little but bit. But you know, of, somebody who represents fighting the purity, cause he always, he's always well, hammering these other leagues about how, they don't have good fighters. It's not fighting. Yeah. And then he invests in his power slap. Well, do you think it's a response to, you know, sort of this circus freak show thing that yes. the Paul brothers yes. have created? I do. You know, he's just like, oh, well, they're profiting and, you know, might as well find oh, some kind of that's an interesting, novel thing. I do. That's an interesting theory. I 100% combat think that. Oh, that's an interesting theory. Mm -hmm. I like that. That this is his response to like this. This yeah. new fight league division type stuff that's coming out with them, like that's I, you know what, yeah, that's a especially good point. for like Instagram and all that. Like you're gonna see probably a lot more influencers getting in this thing and just getting the slap. There shit is out of so them. much of that now. I can't even keep up. 
it's crazy how there is a fight seems like every week of some other influencer person that is fighting another influencer person that's yeah. You know, people think though, like because you're slapping someone, that you can't give them brain damage oh or something. Oh my god! Like, dude, first of all, you, you can, if you hit you're someone, you're not even defending it. You're just taking it. You might not break their skin like with a punch, but you hit someone with the palm, like the, especially oh. the heel of your hand on their yeah. jaw, on their chin. You put them to sleep. You brain it, and they're they're just taking it. Like they have to. Yeah. That's the, it's get the crazy boss, <laughs> boss root and fucking slap. You're, oh. you're out, dude. Lights oh. out. Oh, I know. But I, I watched some of it. I, there was one dude, his face was, I couldn't watch it because his face looked so deformed. Yeah. And he kept getting hit in that deformed side. I was like, oh. He actually won that one he guy. Won. That, <laughs> <laughs> that's what tripped me out. And he said, that he won $5,000. <laughs> he, he did all that for $5,000. I know, for five. Yeah, his, doc, his doctor bills are going to be like, more than that. Uh, like, come on. <laughs> I, know, it's such a, I like how they chalk up their hand. So yeah. when they hit each other, you just see the smoke, the, uh, like the yeah. dust. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, no speak, speaking of business, did I hear you say that uh, Kim Kardashian was getting heat for speaking at Harvard? She for spoke business? at Harvard, and I guess some people at Harvard didn't want her to speak, which I think is fine. So Harvard Business School, so she's talking about business. She knows more about business than most of their professors. That's my opinion. Oh, she's sure. a brilliant business person. I'm she really sure. is. And I, so some people were, were all pissed off. It, sti was, it stings to say that, but it's true. It is true. Yeah. I mean, I she's built massive businesses. And yes, she's got her following and all that stuff, but you can only go so far with that. Yeah, but that's why she built it. Yeah, I mean, she yeah. built it with the intent to, you know, use it to monetize. Yeah. I mean, there it goes all the way back to their parents. I mean, they 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 saw that as a strategy early on. It was it was more about the the ability for them to make money and uh, and make business. But you can only go so far, right? She has like isn't one of her businesses a, a, a billion dollars? Isn't one of them worth a billion dollars? I think she sure. is. Yeah, her net worth is one point eight billion. Like you don't become, you could become a millionaire with fame. Okay, so you could be famous and people know you, and you become a millionaire. But to become a billionaire, you have to know what you're doing. Yeah. Because to go from a hundred million, well, look at to look a at billion she, just since two thousand fourteen. From yeah. two thousand four, I mean, I I love to use the seconds analogy that I used the other day for something like this to highlight the point you're making right now. Like the difference between a a million seconds, a billion seconds, and a trillion seconds, the the leaps are unbelievable. Yeah. So when people Radical. just like discount somebody who's worth millions of dollars, like oh well, she started with million, her family's rich and she has millions, and now she's worth a billion. Like, do you understand the yeah. the the gap between that? It's crazy. It's far easier to go from zero to a million than it is to go from a hundred million to a billion. Yeah, it's a hundred million to a billion. I could give. 10,000 people, $100 million, and none of them would turn it into a billion dollars. That's how hard it is. Yeah. So for her to be worth a billion, $1.8 billion, it's, yes, she's famous and people know her so she can use yeah. that and leverage it. She knows business. Well, she knows I'm business. curious. With, I mean, were they mad about her coming in or were they mad about like the speech she delivered? Was Probably she like, disrupted? Her like, coming in, I'm sure. Yeah. I'm sure they get, you know what I'm saying? Because she's yeah. a, she fly, she flies a, in the face she's of She's a drama reality and, show. Yeah, but didn't she have a law degree? She also has a law degree. I, I think she passed the bar. Really? Yeah. Doug, look it up. She, I, I, I'm almost positive. I mean, you you guys, your house is the house that's washing the Kardashians. Yeah, not even wife, so. Yeah. I don't, I, I'm not going to argue with you on this one. You got well, me. Well, there was that whole thing with her mom. Like, uh, uh, who's it? Uh, one of her, who's her first boyfriend that had the sex tape? Anyway, that uh, came out clean was like her yeah. mom put it out yeah. there deliberately. Doug, she's got a law degree, right? Yeah, in 2021. She, she passed. Oh, what? Just recently passed uh -huh. the bar. Mm -hmm. You know who else just recently passed the bar? Chat GPT. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it did. It also got an MBA. Yes. Oh my God. Yes. Dude. That's messed up, dude. Yeah. It That's is so messed, messed up. up. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. They're gonna have to create AI. To think anymore. Dude, they're gonna have to create AI to be able to to be able to find AI. You know yeah. what I mean? Like you'll turn in your test. Yeah. And the teacher's going to use AI to make sure. That's what they already have. Uh, that's out already. So they already have software out that's already making its rounds. And that's what. And and it's already behind. Somebody's going to make a lot of money on that for schools. And so that because schools are going to have to adopt it because there's this whole idea of everybody has to write in, in, in class is going to only last so long. They have to do homework. They have to do, you know what I'm saying? So. They're going to have to find other yeah, I ways. I wonder about that, right? Like, because I know I told you my brother's approach to that and like what they're doing to school. But like, I mean, how much of it can you do? Like if you're doing a math equation and then you have to like show your work and like do all that, like go back to like the old school way of, uh, uh, you know, uh, proving with just pen and paper. I mean, there's gonna, writing essays and 
Yeah, I mean, I imagine that's you're going to have to do the same thing. Like, show me your notes, show me your brainstorming, show all these things with it in order to prove. Because, or you have to do it in front of me. Otherwise, yeah, how much are you going to learn? Otherwise, and, and even then, like, like the example I gave with how I have Katrina getting ready for the interview, I could still show you the work of putting that together to make it look like that. Yeah, we formulated it or we thought of of most of it. You know, what I'm saying so it doesn't. Well, it's going to be interesting how they try. And I guess stop it's it. narrowed. Wow. You have to narrow it down to this: like, there's the there's value in learning for the sake of learning, and then there's value in learning for the sake of your value in the market, how you support yourself, right? So you can learn all kinds of awesome stuff, and it improves your character, make you know, gives you depth, you know, um, helps you grow as a person, but not necessarily improve or help your your market viability. So in other words, if you need to learn something in school to give you skills for the market, at what point is it just learning how to prompt and use, G, you know, AI? Like at what point is it that and not show well, me the work, show me by hand? Like what what use is that going to be in the market when the market I mean, requires none of that? Courtney and I have speculated even before all this chat GBT stuff of like, you know, there's just going to be an influx of, of developers, programmers, you know, everybody's so focused on building these aspects it's just going to be oversaturated so we're like i'm okay if the boys want to go and go trade school route and like you know literally get back to the basics of like being an electrician being a plumber being somebody that like you know is relevant and we know so many electricians and plumbers they're crushing it right now yeah, making are. a lot of money well like, i mean it's, it's such a shit on uh profession which i think is hilarious to me yeah well no you you make a good point up the it's how interesting would that be if like blue collar work makes a comeback because I guarantee it dude. that's where ai is we're not going to be there's at a, a deficit there where the the robots are going to take over a lot of the blue collar work you like have that. to build robots now the now the it will assist electricians on probably troubleshooting like things and so that and make the, but you'll still need some of it but Along those lines, you just remind me of something. I know our audience is probably tired of this conversation, but so <laughs> did you see the Jamba Juice? No. Oh, I did. Did you I see did. that? Yeah, that it's was on. all yeah. automated, one hundred percent. Yeah, one hundred percent. You really? go in, you order on a computer, and it makes the the, the machine makes so it for it's you. Like, it's like a, it's like, it's a like key, an arm. It's like a, yes, it? it's like a kiosk, and you walk up and you order it. And then it it does it's a little arm, robotic arm, and it blends it, makes it, waits for you to pay it, then sh serves it to you. All and I think it was I think I read that it up to twelve like or eighteen Star Wars Cantina eighteen dude, different uh you know Jamba Juice drinks that it, it makes right now. So Jamba Juice is full. I mean, look out to see those all oh, over the place. Cool. I uh, um I was listening to All In podcast and they were talking about AI engineers based on these AI companies and how much they're getting bought for and valued. They calculated that the average AI engineer is worth two million dollars. So I totally conveyed this to my son because he's going off to college. There I'm like, hey, go. by the way, <laughs> yeah. AI engineers yeah, right now are like, over there. Like they're, they're still worth so much money. Yeah. So you're going to go into computer science. Maybe if you're interested, go into AI science. For oh, sure. Wow. You know, and do that. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> kind of cool, right? You know, speaking of tech, did you see the the January total for layoffs? What it ended up being? What was it? For in tech, 55,000 people just yeah. in Jan January alone. Is that a lot? Because I wow. looked at the unemployment numbers. They look good. Yeah, they still... I hear that there's 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 a I mean are they messing with the numbers? Are they taking people out who aren't looking anymore? You know what I mean? Like yeah, you know they do. Yeah, how are they parsing that? Yeah, yeah, I mean I just there's still a lot more to come. That's for sure. Yeah. You know it's yeah. not it's it's not done anytime soon. So yeah, I, I heard it was somewhat skewed because of um, you know they're not really interviewing a lot of these people that like have no desire to go back to work. Like it's sort of like there was this. Uh, lull of like um, after pandemic where there was like a substantial amount of people that just weren't. So that that's what they say. One of the most interesting stats right now is the amount of unemployed people to the amount of available jobs. Yeah. There is plenty of work. Yeah. Like but, the opportunities there, but it's not. Which is, in, which filled. is weird. Cause that's not normally the case. Normally what happens in, in the recession, well, you they have you, just a bunch of savings. Like how are they able to yeah, do that? Like, like mortgaging their, like yeah. that's, they have to be, I mean, Credit card debt is at all time highs. You have more equity in the average home than ever. So, yeah, people are living off of fake money, right? Yeah. Equity that is, you know, there now, but maybe not be there in, say, five years or whatever like that. And you have credit card, uh, buy now, pay later, all record record highs. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff like that. Wow. Yeah, it's strange, dude. Speaking, yeah. of, speaking of fake money, I know we're, we're almost the end here, but uh, I, I got to read this to you just because you guys have been a part of You guys have been in California as long as I have. Remember in 2008 when they had us vote to build a high-speed rail 
from LA to San <laughs> yeah, Francisco. Yeah, yeah. You guys remember that? Oh, I know yeah, a yeah. lot of shenanigans. Two thousand eight. Yeah. This just good, just a great example. I just want people to just understand this. This is a great example of why you don't want your government building things for you. It just always turns into crap. Mm-hmm. So in 2008, we did a we voted here in California. I remember this, and it was to bi- to pay for a high speed rail from Los Angeles to San Francisco, and it was supposed to be done by 2020. Mm-hmm. And they said in the you know what you voted for, they said the estimated cost would be 30 billion dollars. Okay, here we are, 2023. <laughs> okay, here's the high speed rail. By the way, it's not high speed; it's a normal train. <laughs> it's no longer from LA to San Francisco; it's from Bakersfield to Merced. Ooh. <laughs> and they're hoping it'll be done by 2030 and the cost will be no less than $170 billion. So <laughs> <What the fuck? laughs> that's the biggest bait and switch I've ever heard. Yeah. Time. Wow, bro. <laughs> but we just need to be taxed more so we can give them more money to create these Who, Who's going to take a high speed rail from, from, you know, what was it? What did I say? Bakersfield to Merced? Yeah. yeah. Well, billion. Yeah. Who's motivated for what that? What could we have done with that money? Wow, <laughs> dude. Well, yeah, one, you should look into like who profited off that too. Oh, That's real interesting. Oh, one yeah. last one last stat before your shout, shout out hang up that I, I saw this morning that I thought was really interesting. Um, over 50% of uh, divorces on the, on, on the, you know, the paperwork you got to fill yeah. out for a divorce is that uh, attribute it to uh, social media, Instagram, TikTok, what? Facebook. Over f- more than half. Wow. Have that written in the divorce. Something along the lines of TikTok, Facebook, wow. Instagram, with that were just like a hopeful cheating message. Like, yeah, che- cheating and stuff like he that. He liked the picture. Yeah. DMing. Uh, yeah, dude. So, isn't that crazy? Wow. More, more than something that didn't even exist just, you know, 20 something years ago. Ha, is now well, more than half of divorces. They could, say that that wow. cheating is more about opportunity than it is about morality. So it's like you got, got you know. Of people, course it is. That's got, why, the, my one of my favorite lines is in uh, stand up lines is in Chris Rock when he's making fun of uh, guys that like really shit on dudes that get caught up cheating with that. It's like, motherfucker, you couldn't cheat if you wanted to. Yeah. Ain't nobody want to fuck you. Yeah. It's real easy to be faithful when nobody like and he was because he was comparing to like some super yeah, I'm not impressed famous by, guy who got yep. who, who got you know caught up cheating. I'm not impressed by somebody's like, I never it's like, well, you couldn't. Yeah, yeah. Like I'm impressed by the person who could but doesn't. <laughs> yeah, Big exactly. A hundred percent. Right. That's funny. So for our our shout out, um, I have somebody who uh, is new for me. I just started really following her content. She was in this uh, mastermind group that I on, and I was just so impressed with her story and what she done. And I can't believe I had never heard of her before. Her name's Jasmine Starr. So if you're a a entrepreneur, that's what her content is centered around. She's built multiple businesses, extremely successful, great personality, puts out really good content. Uh, so I just started really digging through a lot of her stuff, and I like what she's putting out there. So if you're a serial entrepreneur and you're looking for advice around content and social media and stuff like that, that's kind of her wheelhouse. So check her out. Hey, check this out. We just started working with this company, Mobility Wall. Look, do you like to foam roll your muscles to improve mobility, range of motion? But getting on the floor is such a pain. It's hard. It's hard to support yourself. Uh, well, Mobility Wall goes in your doorway and it acts like a foam roller and more. So you can improve your mobility, flexibility, your range of motion, and help you connect to your muscles. It feels really good, especially when you're sore and you need to speed up recovery. Great company. It's a great product. Go check them out. Go to mobilitywall.com forward slash mind pump. And if you use the code mind pump at checkout, you'll get 20% off your first order. All right, here comes the show. Our first caller is Cameron from Georgia. Hey, Cameron, how can we help you? Hey, thanks, Doug. Hey, guys, how are you? Good, how are you? Fantastic. It's so good to be here. It's so surreal. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Before I jump in, uh, like so many other listeners, just wanted to say you truly changed my life. I've had a complete breakthrough in mindset and understanding of health and fitness since being introduced to you. And frankly, especially as a woman lifter, feel more empowered than ever. So just wanted to say a big thank you. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Now that that's out of the way, though, more importantly, (laughs) um, I wrote in with a three-part question, but I promise to be super efficient. Um, For a little bit of context, I started weightlifting in 2017 after about a decade of exclusively practicing yoga. 
Um, in 2018, I started with my first CPT and was with him for about four years. I thought I was in really great shape, but had no idea what I was missing out on. Uh, we primarily trained hit high rep, low weight, minimal rest, lots of sweat. Um, not to mention the fact that I, there was just a zero plan in place as far as what like week over week, month over month, year over year was going to look like. Uh, last summer, I transitioned to a new CPT who eventually introduced me to Mind Pump. Um, originally, I was super skeptical of her programming because it was really different than what I was used to. It was higher <laughs> weight, lower volume, longer rest periods. Um, I frankly just felt like I wasn't doing enough every day because I wasn't leaving with this crazy sweat. Um, and but it wasn't until I was introduced to you guys that I started like religiously listening to your podcast. I was going back through hundreds of episodes, listening to listener questions. Um, and really eventually it just clicked for me. And I decided last summer it was time for me to take control of my own body and programming. And that's when I purchased aesthetic, uh, which I started in September and, Y'all, I have never experienced transformation like this in my entire life. So thank you. Um, I completed aesthetic. I went immediately into performance and then transitioned into anabolic a couple weeks ago. Yes, it was backwards, but probably not surprising that I went for aesthetic. Um, so I don't have a baseline from when I first started aesthetic, but in four months, I lost 11 pounds of fat and gained five pounds of muscle. And I also went from uh, tracking zero food, no macro at all, to tracking every bite and making sure that I never, ever miss a protein target. So that's kind of where I'm at. Um, long intro. But my question is this. I am going on a month-long vacation in February for my birthday, and I'm really anxious about my gym routine and being out of it. Uh, one week kills me, much less four, but at least with one week, I can take your advice around having some break and the rest and recovery and what it does for my body. And so I'll have limited access to come, you know, subpar hotel gyms. And I did go ahead and buy maps anywhere, but I'm wondering, is this enough? Um, I'm really worried about regression and I just have made so much progress. So I want to make sure that I'm like doing everything I can to continue the progress and be in a good spot when I come home. Yeah. This is, this is awesome. You're, you're, you're okay. So two, two things I'll say yeah. to that one if you do, first off, you're very fit. We could see yeah. you. You're very fit. You've made tremendous gains in progress with awesome. muscle and fat. Yeah. Yeah, awesome so, gains. Yeah, great jobs. Yeah. Really good. E even if you did regress in a month, whatever regression you made in a month would come back in like a week or two So of coming back. So even if you were to regress, it would be so temporary. And the trade, in my opinion, would be worth it because it's a break from counting every bite that you put in your mouth and being so structured to being on vacation. Now, that being said, if you did maps anywhere while you were gone, you probably won't regress at all. You'll probably be totally fine. And if anything, you might even come back a little stronger because it's different, it's novel, and it's going to give you a little bit of a break because maps anywhere doesn't use much equipment except for maybe bands. So um, you literally have nothing to worry about yeah, at re all. Remember, remember the way you thought originally when you first did a maps program and 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 switched from your kind of training you were and thought, oh my god, I'm going to lose all that. That same mentality you have right now is. And if you were to do anywhere, I actually don't even think you need to do that. But if you wanted to, you could. I think if you actually hit the gym once a week. While you're out there, do like a full body workout for 45 you minutes. You would you would main, you would maintain most everything you got, and even if you had a tiny bit of a setback, it lit right right way when you as yeah. soon as long as you don't do this. Here's where the mistake that people make when they go on a vacation like this is they go they they go from being so dialed like you are right now to the complete opposite in the spectrum where they eat like an asshole, don't train whatsoever, and then they they that's where you So what what he means by that Cameron is that you're it's not that you're not you're going from tracking to not tracking. It's that you go from tracking to binging. To yeah. binging. Yeah, to just to where you're eating till you're uncomfortable, drinking every night. I mean Yeah, just, like like you it's like you're pushing it in the opposite direction. It's more of a behavior thing. Um yeah. so that that's where, you know, some damage can happen and most of the damage even then wouldn't be physiological, it'd be psychological. Because then going from that to having to go back to tracking, it really kind of encourages this on-off 
mm-hmm. uh, kind of mentality. But I think you're totally fine. You're going to be completely fine going over there. Mess around. So here's, let me ask you this question, Cameron. How valuable are your workouts for just setting your day up and the mental aspect of it? Forget the phys- phys- physical. Is it real important for the me- mental part too? I mean, I spend like two hours every morning in the gym when I wake up and it's not all lifting for two hours, but just like being there and doing mobility. And like, I never miss a trigger session. I never, I'm, I love being in the space to your point from a mental perspective. Okay. So, so try this then. Cause I get, a, I get most of the benefits I get from exercise now are mental for me. It's, um, mm-hmm. uh, I really value it for that. So when I'm on vacation, my workouts aren't at all like the workouts um, when I'm home. My workouts more are like I'm going to start my day with 30 minutes of something just to – it's like coffee for me or like mm-hmm. a, it's a, it's like my antidepressant. So I wake up. I'll do 30 minutes in a hotel gym. It usually looks like a full body, you know, machine to machine to machine, couple dumbbell exercises, and then I'm done. So I just start my day that way just because it feels good. So, I mean, you can even do something like that where you do like a 30-minute something. It could be yoga. You said you did yoga before. It could be a few machines just to kind of, you know, touch the, you know, each area of the body and just kind of feel good. Um, okay. and, and that, that's very valuable, but I don't want you to think about like physical fitness. Yeah. So I, I think the one thing you're going to, the common thread you're going to hear from all of us is that so long as you don't go binge eating, drinking on your four weeks off and you have some sort of attempt to do any sort of exercise, whether it be 15 minutes, 30 minutes, once a week, couple times. To- you're going to be totally okay. Mm-hmm. You really are. You're going to be. You're going to be fine. And in fact, because you've been so consistent for a while now, your body might want a little bit of a rest, and you might see some actually real big benefits to kind of scaling back a little bit for a month and enjoying yourself. So, I, I think you're going to be just fine. Yeah, I'll do it. Kind of what Sal's talking about in terms of like you know something just to get me up and alert and um, you know enjoy my day more. So if that helps, just like a cup of coffee or just like planning activities that you're just moving a lot more. Mm-hmm. And, and like visiting and and doing things that you normally wouldn't do, uh, like uh, you know paddle boarding or whatever, you know, like things that I'm like structuring. I know I'm gonna have some physicality to it. Um, you know, you're gonna be just fine. It's, it's honestly, it's a good break for your body. Uh, anyway, you know what? One more thing uh, in regards to the eating part. If if you do anything, even though you're gonna be on vacation, I don't expect you to track, and I wouldn't make a client do this. But if you wanted to mitigate any sort of muscle loss, is stick to the protein thing at least. Mm-hmm. So that would be okay. kind of like, so I, what yeah, I choose know, high protein meals. Yeah, yes. Yeah. yeah. Choose high protein meals or, or at least just pay attention to kind of the grams of protein on it, on a, on a, during your, your time off, because that's an area where you could see. So if you were to over consume, you know, junk food and alcohol and also under consume protein and also not lift weights, you could see a pretty dramatic change in a month of like falling off of what, all this work you've done. But if you do a good job of eating most of your meals, being protein centric, you know, getting a few workouts in while you're out there and not binge eating, you're going to be just, you're going to be yeah. just fine. But the, I, I would add the com- the combo of not eating enough protein could be, could, you could lose some, let, some muscle let mass. Me, let me, ha- let me, let me put it, or phrase it differently. Okay. So d- two things to this. Uh, one is that if you look at the studies on deload weeks and they even have studies where people will do a deload for two weeks. So these are these are people like you, consistent. They work out. They're you know totally on, and then they'll do like a, a deload is basically, essentially no exercise or minimal exercise. They gain more muscle in the deload week than they do during their consistent weeks. So mm-hmm. that's from a physiological standpoint. But this might help. Okay, think of your mental health more than your physical health when you're on vacation. That's going to give you. That's going to point you in a better direction than thinking about your physical health. So. To, to do it, to kind of talk about what Adam said about protein, you could think to yourself, I need to eat the protein so I don't lose the muscle. But I think it'd be more effective to say, I need to eat the protein because protein is going to make me feel more satiated. I'm going to be less mm-hmm. likely to want to eat uh, you know, junk food. It's going to give me more consistent blood sugar. So I'm not going to have these energy highs and lows while I'm on vacation. It'll help mitigate uh, feeling crappy from alcohol that I make. So think of things from a mental standpoint. Uh, another example would be, instead of thinking I need to work out because I'm going to lose muscle, think, hey, I want to, tomorrow, we're going to go do that that you know snorkeling or we're going to go hiking. I'm going to do some mobility beforehand so that I can feel really good on the hike, okay? If you think of it from a mental standpoint, 
then physically you'll actually get better results than if you think of it from a physical standpoint. If you think of everything from a physical standpoint, you'll enjoy your vacation less and you may fall into this off on type of mentality. That's where people tend to screw up. So think of it from, from that standpoint. I think it uh, that makes the biggest difference. Also, do you have MAP suspension? Because that's another great mm -hmm. travel program. I think you named like the one program I don't have. I own the <laughs> whole, like, I think I own 12 or 14 programs. Okay. So I don't have suspension. Well, you got it. You got suspension now. We're, we're going to send it over to we're you. We're going to send it to you. <laughs> and if you have a suspension trainer, like super easy to travel with, and then you don't even need a hotel gym. You can hang it in the doorway, and then you're you don't even have to leave your room. Okay. Yourself. I, bu I believe when we send, I don't know, Doug. When we send it for free, does the email automatically kick her the fifty percent off? I believe it does. Yes. Okay, so you mm -hmm. should when you get the program for free. Okay. That we normally send an automatic email for fifty percent off of the the straps too. So you get a really good deal on the straps. So we have okay. them. So just so you know, for sure. Yep. Yeah, I'll definitely do that. So really quick follow up. I will leave right close to the end of phase two of anabolic which I'm loving. Um, I just started two weeks ago, but it's been awesome. My strength gains have been crazy in two weeks. Like I've been really surprised. Um, would you want me to start back where I left off when I come home or like repeat something? And then lastly, what program should I do next? <laughs> yeah. You could do the, pro I would do the program over a, yeah, whole it, a whole month. I'd start the program. It doesn't, over. And I mean, it really, honestly, it really doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. What matters most is that you give yourself a week Cause you're going to take a, a month off. So I'm going to assume yeah. that you're going to take a month off of like, like hard lifting, mm -hmm. give yourself a week of easy lifting. So I don't care where you start it really doesn't make a big, it's not like, so people think maps anabolic goes from phase one, two and three, because it scales. That's not mm -hmm. how it works. It's just different. It's just novel, just new novel stimulus. So phase one can be hard or easy depending on who you are and so on. So it really doesn't matter, but give yourself a week when you get back of easy workout. So I would do a week of pre-phase, and then jump into okay. whatever phase you want. Doesn't make you can start over if you want to okay. do it that way. Uh, doesn't doesn't make a big difference. And then program next. I have you done Map Strong? No, I that's someone oh, that's like yeah. on the list. I have it. Do that. You'll love it. Do that. Yeah. You'll love it. Yeah, that that yeah. yeah. You you'll love that. It's like one of our most popular programs uh, by women. By women. Yeah, they normally <laughs> avoid. Really? Yeah, it's yeah. one of the ones you that they avoided, so. and then they do it, and they're like, "Oh my god, it's my favorite now." That you'll yeah. love it. Well, do because it. it's like shorter. Every day has so so many few so much fewer exercises. So it's very different than what I'm used to doing from a volume perspective, yeah. but wait, it looks really Yeah, good. wait till the other, okay, the so work sessions. The work sessions. are totally yeah, different. Yeah, strong is it kind of, of flip-flop. Like, head. you know how trigger days are your easy days? Yeah. Work session days are harder for a lot of people than the foundational days. Way harder. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. yeah. So okay. it, it'll be, cool. it'll be very different from what you've been doing. So it'll, it'll be a nice shock for the system. You'll like it. Awesome. Fantastic. Yeah. Really grateful for all the information, and it's so awesome to meet you guys in person. Thanks, all right, Cameron. Cameron. Have all a right. good vacation. Keep killing so it. Yeah, you got it. Bye bye. What did you see her? Did you see the actually her her stats? I did. She sent them over. Great progress. Yeah, yeah that, that was fun. even not Amazing. even. That's not even her taking it from the start. Man, if anybody's listening and they're doing like the traditional circuits and tons of running and all that stuff, and especially if you're female, just listen. You have nothing to lose. Mm -hmm. What's the worst thing that can happen? You you try something for a few few weeks, you go back to what you were doing before. Try our, one of our programs and watch what happens to your body. Watch what happens to your metabolism. Watch how easy it becomes to lose body fat. It will blow your mind. The hardest step is going to be just making yes. that first step. That's the the most difficult part is to get in that headspace that I'm going to do something completely outside of my norm. Mm -hmm. But if you do that and you trust in it, man, the results will come. This is also why we we take so much heat around the cardio conversation is because people think that we're anti-cardio. No, it's just that we know that that is our average client right yeah. there. Yeah. She is somebody, she is the 80% of the people that came to me over those two decades. That's how they worked out. Were worked was just like yep. she was as far as her mentality towards lifting weights and to get them to transition from that thought process and the run and burn calories and, and thinking that exactly. way to getting strong, lifting weights, long rest periods. And I mean, it just, that's why we keep hammering that message. It's not because we don't think people should do cardio and it's not healthy for them. It's that most people, especially if you actively listen to a fitness podcast or you're looking for information on that, are in very similar boat as Especially if you're a female. Yes. Especially if you're a female. Our next caller is Todd from Utah. Todd, what's happening? How's what it up, happening? Todd? Hello, Todd. What's up, guys? Yeah, appreciate you bringing me on. Um, 
fairly new listener last couple of weeks, really just been binging a bunch. So oh, wow. Appreciate that. Um, so I've just learned about trigger sessions and I think I understand the basic, basic concept there, but I just wanted to ask something kind of in regards to that. Um, so a little backstory and kind of my goals. I've been working out for a long time. The last couple of years, I've been doing more like F45 style training. But this year, I'm really just trying to work on like strength, like traditional gym strength exercises. Part of the reason for that is I think due to my snowboarding and wakeboarding, my left leg is significantly weaker. So I really want to focus on kind of bringing that up. That being said, um, on my rest days, I do like to do that more high intensity cardio, whether it's like sprint intervals or rowing intervals or more like explosive plyometric type training. But is that too much for like those trigger sessions? Is that, yes. is that going to be like a trigger session that's going to actually yes. Yes. weaken the rest or kind of where's the balance there? Yes. That's uh, the biggest mistake that people make with the trigger sessions is actually doing too much. They, they're, they're designed to facilitate recovery, not build muscle. Yes, th that helps build muscle, but the thought process of going in there, tearing and breaking down and the way you, you approach the foundational days is completely opposite of how you approach the trigger session. The trigger session, should, you're literally just sending, sending a signal, pumping, pumping the muscle up with blood. You're not trying to get a major burn. You're not trying to get sore. That's all you're really trying to do. Uh, and so, yeah, plyometric work for sure would be, I mean, it's on the uh, far end of the other spectrum of trigger yeah, sessions. Well, Todd, why are you doing the intervals and in, in the circuit training? Is Do you want endurance and stamina too? Yeah, exactly. I just, I want to keep my kind of athleticism high and kind of, yeah, that, that performance athletic aspect. Mm. Um, so I'm not necessarily doing it for the burn, but obviously that's a side effect of sprinting. Like your legs are going to burn, right? You'd be surprised. So I don't know if I could just push that out to a different cycle of programming and kind of avoid that altogether. Or I mean, it depends. It depends like what you're looking that. for. Like, um, so part of your question was, is that too much damage? I mean, too much for what or who? I mean, it depends on the context of your own recovery, your life, and what's going on. If you want to continue to work on endurance and stamina along with strength, you'll get less of both, but you'll get some of both. If you want to maximize strength, then you should do less of the other stuff. If you want to maximize endurance, then you do less of the other stuff. So if you're okay with getting a little of both, but not a lot of either, then that's that's totally fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, uh, you know, most people want you know some of everything rather than a lot of something and less of other stuff. So it's fine. You'll build less muscle and be le and you won't gain as much strength likely. But if you want the stamina and endurance along with some strength gains. There's nothing wrong with that. Now, how do you know if it becomes too much? If you're not getting either, you, you're just burnt out, you're not getting stronger, you're feeling stiff, sore, you're not getting good sleep, then you're overtrained, and then you need to probably drop the volume and intensity, improve things like sleep and nutrition. You know, I struggled with this a lot, uh, you know, being an ex-athlete, and this is like the challenge for me and the mindset going into every workout was always to crush every workout, was to, you know, bring the intensity. And so, you know, with this, uh, I would say to, uh, to really try your best to focus on um, being able to reinforce and stabilize around your joints. So you're, you're thinking longer term in terms of like high performance. So in order to, to, to maintain and keep that that high performance accessible, we're going to need to, uh, you know, make sure that our, our joints are responding and, um, you know, the functionality of them uh, maintains for as long as possible. And the more you get into mobility, the more you get into these types of trigger sessions where it's benefiting active recovery, you're going to see the benefit like you've never seen because this is good, this is a brand new focus. So, uh, you know, in terms of cardiovascular endurance, like that's something that you can adapt towards uh, fairly quickly. Uh, so if we if we just take a break and, and take a moment away from that and really just focus more on um, you know reinforcing the body in, in in order to to apply more of the stress onto it, you're you're gonna do uh, so much further than you would. Before. Yeah, I like I like what he said. I, I like just what Justin said a lot. I think it'd be great for you to just focus on building muscle and strength for a few months. I I agree with that. Now 
depending on how important the wakeboarding and snowboarding is to you and and staying up with the ability to do that, what I might do is this. So the program that comes to mind, their order for me would be symmetry, performance, then aesthetic in that order. The days that you're not weight training, foundational days, I would do 12 minutes of hit cardio. Because I know that when you when you snowboard and when you wakeboard, you're not you're not up longer than about twelve minutes. Okay, so you're not you're not going to be st- unless you're just cruising behind the boat. If you're doing any sort of tricks or playing aggressive at all, you probably ride for five to seven minutes, then crash, then get back up, and then do your thing. Same thing with snowboarding; you're never riding down the mountain longer than you know five to eight minutes to get down to the bottom even if you're riding one of the big places like squaw valley or like in park city area like you're not riding long so that 12 minutes of hit cardio will give you enough of the stamina endurance that you need to to be good at your your sports that you love doing uh and it's probably not going to impede that much on your strength training if you were to go do long bouts of cardio lots of plyometrics in addition that i don't see you building on strength but i think you can absolutely build strength and still keep a little bit of that cardio endurance that you want. So when you get when you hit the mountain or when you're wakeboarding, you don't feel like you're well, gassed. Well, Todd, are you going to be? Because um, this brings up something else. Are you going to be? Are you able to snowboard now? Are you doing that now while you're training? Um, not as much nowadays, more than I used to. But yeah, I'll still go up. I'm going up to snowboard for a week next week. I'm here in Utah, so I'll go up quite a few, and then I wakeboard quite a bit in the summer. Okay, so well. I mean, so, if, if you so. did, if you if you snowboarded, you know, once or twice a week while doing, um, you know, pure strength training program, you'll be yeah, fine. Yeah, that's not that's not realistic. Unless, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how often. Yeah, unless he's unless you're. Yeah, I won't, I, I'm not going to go that much. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. Then, yeah so then. he just wants to be able to keep it. Got so that's it. what I'm saying. You do two to three days a week of twelve minutes of hit cardio. Uh, that will give you what you are looking for for wakeboarding and snowboarding. And this is coming from somebody who yeah. does does both of those. That's plenty of cardiovascular endurance for that. So I'll, I, And then strength train. And I love symmetry because you made the the point about having discrepancy between your left and right. That's what that program is designed oh, for. Oh, that'll be huge for that. Is to balance that out. I love performance for the, all the points that Justin was was bringing up to follow that program up. And then aesthetic to uh, take the, you know, symmetry thing even further. Um, I love that. I love that order right there. And then I love the idea of 12 minutes of hit cardio while you're... And the, what that looks like is elliptical, Stairmaster, treadmill... Uh, you know, going after it hard for, you know, 20 to 30 seconds, hard sprints, heart like that. And then letting the heart rate come all the assault way back bike's down. Awesome for that. Yeah. Or assault bike. So any, any cardio tool going as hard as you can for 20 seconds and then walking or slowing way down and letting the heart rate come all the way back. A mistake that people make with hit is they, they get online and they follow some protocol. It's like 20 on one off and then they, and they're, they don't necessarily need that or they're not allowing themselves to fully recover uh, the heart rate to come back down. The real benefits of that is what happens of the heart recovers and then goes really hard and then recovers. That's where you get the max benefits for that. So if that takes you 45 seconds to fully recover, that's fine. If it takes you two minutes to fully recover, that's fine also. So, you know, fill it out based off of where your where your endurance is at. Do you have symmetry, Todd? Uh, I do not. All right, we'll send that to you. Okay. I right, really appreciate it, guys. You got All it, man. man. All Thanks right, for dude. calling in. You bet. You know what the irony is of, of having one side significantly stronger than the other is that what will likely happen is as he balances himself out, he'll get stronger on the strong side as well because there's that kind of, there seems to be a limiting you know, like a limiter in the body that doesn't allow one side to get too much stronger than the other one. So in other words, people, his performance will probably improve on, on both sides mm-hmm. because he's working on the weak side. You know, a what bit I mean? of that some, irradiation effect too. A, yeah, absolutely. You know, this is such a common thing that we get where, uh, you know, you want to eat your cake and have it too, right? Yeah. Where like it's, you know, and so it's always, it's always, and obviously it's, it's always nuanced, but this, you know, a lot of times I think people need to really ask themselves, what is it I want the most? Or at least have some sort of a, that would help us, right? Yep. Here's my hierarchy. Like this is most important to me than this, than this, than this. Cause then the advice changes. Otherwise we have to sit there and ask a lot of questions to find out because if we, what he started with, I want to build strength. I want to build muscle. Well, okay, well then plyometrics and cardiovascular training and endurance is not the most ideal thing for us. If that's really what you want. 
But then if you go like, well, I love to snowboard and wakeboard and I do that a lot and I don't want to lose performance there. Okay, well, how important is that in comparison? Because uh, there's a lot of different ways that we can uh, approach this programming with someone like this. But what really matters is what you really want the most, right? Mm -hmm. Desired outcome. Our next caller is Jeff from Illinois. Jeff, what's happening? How can we help What you? up, Jeff? What's going on? Thanks for having me on. You got it. Um, I've, uh, my question is based on the psychology of getting away from the bro splits and the old bodybuilding lifestyle. So I started out most, mostly like other people started working out in high school because of sports and just got hooked on it. And I had great success with the bro split for nor for a long time, probably 15 years. But then I, uh, me and my wife had children and there's just not the time to be in the gym six hours a week, seven hours a week, every week. And I've run through your guys, anabolic and performance programs. And I loved them. They got me in tremendous shape, but I always have that like itch to go back to the bro split for the hypertrophy, the pumps that just, ju um, just the feeling. So I didn't know if you guys experienced that, if you guys went through a time where family, I mean, obviously family always comes first, but I didn't know how to, if there was a program out there to put on, put, get those hypertrophic feelings back only go into the gym like three days a week or how that worked for you guys. Have you done aesthetic? Uh, I haven't done aesthetic. So I looked at it and my only concern was the two hours. It's the three days a week, the two hours in the gym. Real, realistically, I have about an hour to an hour and 20 minutes on my three days a week that I can actually hit the weights. Yeah. You know, I, you know, I, when I switched from body part splits to full body, the, the, the progress I got is what always kind of kept me there. Um, that got me more excited, but I also like strength a lot. And so when I see, see my strength going up, I tend to also be motivated by that. You know, what's funny is I hit a PR recently in, de in a deadlift from doing maps 15 from doing kind of 20 minutes a day is, is kind of how mine looked about 20, 25 minutes a day. And I hit a PR so that always mm -hmm. keeps me excited, but the mental aspect is, um, I mean, that's going to be kind of what you make it. It's, I, I get the whole, like, you know, going every, going to the gym every day, hitting us, you know, one or two body parts, getting that, that awesome pump. But I don't know, for me, it was, uh, you know, when the pump went away, I didn't get the same kind of gains. So it wasn't hard to kind of leave that behind. Now we do have split programs like map split, but that's six days a week in the gym. You can only go three yeah. days a week. You know, I think MAPS Anabolic is going to be the way to go. It's mm -hmm. going to be the way to go. Unless you want to do something like MAPS 15 where you're just doing 20 minutes a day. If you have a barbell at home, you could be able, you can even do that at home and follow that kind of 20-minute advanced version of it. And like I said, I hit a PR. Okay. I hit a PR, lifetime PR in my 40s from doing that. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I totally remember going through this. Um, and by the way, there's, there's nothing that says you can't phase in and out of doing kind of a, you know, bro-ish split, you know, pump type of phase where you get a little bit of that and then transition back to more of the full body stuff. Just the the, the challenge is mentally a, a attaching the results to why you do those things, right? Is this that you, you know, you've already gone through some of the programs, so you know what good of results you get by running the full body. And so reminding yourself that, you know, that's part of why I do this. Now, Part of why we do this too sometimes though is just for the enjoyment of working out. So where you're at uh, in your life too matters. So like there's times where there's times where I'm training and I know that the way I'm training is not uh, resulting or is go going to elicit the best results for me. But I don't care because mm -hmm. it's what I want to do. Because I'm an, I'm in a I'm in a mode of I want to get good at my Turkish get up, and so I'm prioritizing that, and I may be ignoring some other things. Um, so there, there's that factor too, and I think when uh, that really kind of hit home for me as I transitioned into fatherhood, and, and my priorities started to shift, and it was just like I've already proven to myself I can be the super buff guy. 
Uh, now I do this more for staying healthy and fit. And yes, I know if I were to follow MAPS anabolic protocol, this would be the best for building muscle and getting strength and my metabolism. And that's ideal, but I don't feel like doing that right now. I'm going to do these things. So, but then I'm also very realistic with my results from that. Like I know that there's something out there that I could be doing that's going to give me better results. So I'm not going to get disappointed by doing Turkish get-ups every day and mm -hmm. and being like, damn it, my fucking chest doesn't look as good as it yeah. looked six months ago when I was doing my my bro split stuff. So there, there's also that aspect, right? Like we don't always have to be hitting the gym for, with the most ideal way to lift. Sometimes you love, if you love getting a pump and you want to do that, then then do it. But I'll be be mindful of that there is obviously there's a trade-off there's, there's yeah. a trade-off did did um so going back to maps anabolic because in terms of your scheduling and everything i agree like i think that's probably your best option uh for what you're trying to accomplish did you take full advantage of the trigger sessions did you apply multiple times a day in between i know for me personally like in terms of hypertrophy um, that was something that helped, you know, at least like give me that kind of stimulus, uh, especially, well, even <clears throat> phase two, phase three. I mean, it's very hypertrophy focused. It is a different mm -hmm. because it's like total body. So I think there might be that kind of an adjustment uh, period to that. But honestly, if you if you keep maintaining and doing, um, you know, multiple times a day, especially with the trigger sessions, you're going to get You'll get that up. pump. Yeah, you'll, you'll get, get that, that pump. pump. Yeah, did you do those consistently? So, so I did the trigger sessions. I only did them once a day, and the reason that I did that was, I on my trigger session days I felt great, but then when I went back to the weights, there were times that I felt certain muscles were kind of sore, not so sore that I couldn't lift. But the trigger sessions, I I felt like I wasn't getting the most out of the weights because I was getting a little bit sore from the trigger session. You went too hard, which too surprised hard. me because. To to intense, we'll do yeah, yeah. Go go much uh, lower intensity. Just get a pump and, and more frequently. Just get a pump with the trigger session. Yeah. Don't don't yeah. do don't nothing intense. I lo I love having my and I don't know if you wear in your house. This makes the most sense. Uh, my other house I was at, I had a, a door that was right by the living room where the TV kitchen was, and I used to just just Katrina and I would leave the 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 bands strapped up to the door so they just were there and like mm -hmm. you know if i caught myself sitting watching sports for an hour or two at halftime <laughs> i'd get up and get a cool little you know five minute pump real easy and then sit just back till you fill up you know yeah. and then you stop yeah okay yeah are you do you awesome. have do you have access to maps 15 um so i have maps anabolic performance and 15 yeah okay good have you tried it yet Yes. Um, I, I actually enjoyed it. It was, I felt myself focusing more on the time limit than what I was actually lifting though, because it was, I was focusing on getting it done. Yeah. So I, I enjoyed the workout and I felt like I did get a workout out of it, but I felt like I wasn't as intense as I could be on the lifts because I was more focused on like, okay, I got it. I got 20 minutes. I got to get this done in 20 minutes. Right. And let, I mean, if, if you have to get it done in 20 minutes, sure. But the other thing is someone might make the mistake and say, it's got to be done in 20 minutes, even though they don't necessarily have a time limit. We <clears> need <throat> it maps 15 because you can do the workout in 15 minutes. Yeah. If you want to stretch it out to 30 minutes, that's totally fine. Here's another thing too. Okay. There's nothing wrong with doing a upper body one day, lower body another day, upper body another day. You're not going to hit the body parts as frequently, but you can do more volume. Yeah, I split anabolic like that sometimes. Mm -hmm. I love to do that where I'll take anabolic's protocol, but I'll run uh, the you know the upper body one day, the next day I go lower body, and then just alternate back and forth. And then I end up doing like an extra set for each body part so I can get that kind of pump feeling more because it you know sometimes just one exercise for a body part, I can't quite, but, but by the second exercise or the second or the additional sets, I will feel that for sure. Oh, okay. All right. That's an option. Yeah. Awesome. All right, man. Well, good luck. I know you're a dad, so Thank you know balancing family with all this yep. can be real challenging. It's a, it's a whole new ball game. Yep. Yeah, well, I appreciate it. Thanks for all the info, guys. You got all right, it, man. All right. stay, stay, stay excited. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't like any of our advice. <laughs> no, I, I think I think he, I think he's just kind of taking it all. Everybody's always looking for that, like you know, silver bullet or whatever yeah, that you're going to give I them. Know. Like, oh, that's what I was missing. And then you know, I want to reiterate the point that I was I was trying to make is that you know people ask us a lot of these questions, and you can hear this like underlining. Well, I really want to do this. You know, it's like, well, then you can do then that. Do it. Yeah. You know, then do it. You know, but just if you're going to ask us what's the best for whatever. A desired outcome you have we're gonna we're gonna probably try and steer you as close as possible 
But then there's there is times in my life when I know I'm not doing right. what is the best look, for well, me. Especially if like, you enjoy that. That's right? right. Like you look forward to it. Like go for it for yeah. a while. You know, come back and change it up. But yeah, if that's something you you thoroughly enjoy, I think there's nothing stopping also, you. Also, look, it, this is a hard transition when you have kids. He's got two little girls. He said in his question. Were they really little? I thought he had been a dad for a while. It says I'm a dad of two. Oh, I guess so. Yeah, so maybe they aren't little, but he's got two kids. I mean, here's the bottom line. Like, nothing's going to be the same anymore. Like, go out to dinner. (laughs) It's true. Go out to dinner (laughs) with kids. Life just sucks now. No, it doesn't suck. (laughs) See, that's the problem. It's different. It's, yes. It sucks if you you think it has to be the same. No. If you think it has to be the same and you can't. Uh, except that it's different, it will suck. Like, go out to dinner with kids. It's a very different dinner. You know what it is? It could be very fun, but if I expect to have this deep conversation with my wife romantic and connect setting. and romantic yeah. and it's no. quiet with kids, I'm going to hate it. Now, if I go and I expect it's going to be hectic, but we're going to have fun and my kids are going to throw food, I'm going to throw food back, we're going to laugh, <laughs> get the hell out real quick because, <laughs> we, you know, the kids start to, Like, <laughs> you got to expect something. So, yeah. like, I work Reading out at the couple's dinner. I work out at 6 a.m. in the morning. Like, I don't expect to get the same workout I would get as if I worked out at 1 p.m., which yeah, is yeah. the ideal yeah. time for me. So it's everything's going to be different. You, you you can't have everything. That's no, you're right. I think that's I think that's a, such a great point. Is especially with fatherhood, you either you either embrace it and look forward to the change and the new way that you're going to do things, no, or you're going to you're going to hate life, or you resist it and keep trying to find ways to go back to how you liked things or did things before. And I guess I was lucky where I was at. It being so late in life, like I was so ready. You were for, ready to change. Ready for that transition yeah. that I've embraced this new way of training and the th- things that I care about. And so yeah. the, just the motivation, you know, is who different. struggles the most when they have kids are people who are like, Oh, I'm going to be exactly the same. I'm still going to go out. We're still yeah. going to do the same stuff. Well, you know why that, the same shit, you know why that is? So like, you're going to have a tough poker time. night every weekend. Yeah, guys. There, there's, there's actually a, there, you know why? Because there's, there's like one side that talks about, Oh my God, you have kids and it's your life is over. It's, it's all this and it's whatever. Then you have the other side are like, that's not true at all. We we brought our kids into our life and our life. We still do all the same yeah, thing. It's still different. My yeah. two year old goes to the nightclub. With yeah, me. yeah, yeah. I just <laughs> I think that that's the mis- <laughs> is to mislead people into thinking that it's still different. That Take them with you. It's going to be just like it was before. No, it's not. It's going to be very different. And hopefully, you're excited about what very different. I know. Looks I had like. friends like that. They're like, well, we take our kids on all the vacations. Like, well, good for you, but yeah. they're not the same, are they? Right. <laughs> it's not yeah. the same. Our next caller is Riley from Georgia. Right. What's happening? How can I help you? Hey, Mind Pump team. Uh, Thanks so much for having me on and everything you guys do to help improve the online fitness space. Um, Really help my life dramatically and the lives of others. Um, Really look forward to the content you guys put out each week. Uh, So thank you for that. You got it. Thanks, man. Um, So I've uh, always naturally had large muscular legs. I played sports, which emphasized lower center of gravity. Squatting came really easy to me, able to move significant weight at a young age, um, probably some genetic factors at play. I'm basically in the category of lifters that can catch a glimpse of of someone squatting at the gym and suddenly uh, their pants don't fit. Mm -hmm. Um, I've tried to transition to kind of a a trimmer, leaner, more functional, proportionate, uh, lower body, and despite very consistent work on my upper body, I've not really seen a balancing out in my physique. Um, I never really squat nowadays, but do all the other core lifts typically skip leg day pretty frequently, but you can never really tell by looking at me. Uh, I do carry a little bit of body fat at the moment, um, but even at my most trim, I still felt uh, disproportionate. Uh, Wondering, is there a way to transition my lower body into a a trimmer, more dense muscular structure, or even just shed size? Um, Would you recommend squatting at all, higher rep ranges, um, or other training modalities instead? I feel like avoiding legs altogether is probably not the answer. Um, but I would like to get a place where I feel more kind of symmetrical from an upper lower perspective. Screw you, Riley. We don't help guys yeah. like you. Yeah. <laughs> Riley, I thought that might be a response. Yeah. <laughs> Riley, besides, okay, so you're saying is you got really big legs and then your upper body doesn't match your lower body, right? Uh, yes. Minotaur. Okay. Right. And then do you, are, do you store a lot of body fat in your lower body too? Or do you store body fat like the traditional way that men do in the, in the belly area? Um, I do store in the belly. That's where I notice it the most. Okay. Um, I have had like caliper tests done and uh, they often like get a very uh, small reading on my legs. So I do think I carry okay. not as much body fat in my legs. Okay. Okay. Cause I was going to, I was going to give you a different answer if, if you also stored in your lower body, in which case I'd have you get your hormones tested. But if it's muscle, I suggest, uh, are you familiar with Tom Platts? Do you know, do you know who he is? 
Um, the name sounds familiar, but I don't think I can place the philosophy. Okay, so, so Tom Platz was a bodybuilder, P-L-A-T-Z. Greatest legs ever. In the 70s and 80s, uh, known for having the best legs in bodybuilding. But he had this similar problem where his yeah. lower body, when he first started, just was far more developed than his upper body. But over time and over training, he, he was able to balance his body out uh, quite a bit and, and actually became quite a successful bodybuilder. So... I would read up on him and what he did to kind of balance things out. As far as making your lower body shrink, yes, any kind of strength training is going to keep your leg size. You can focus on mobility and flexibility in the lower body, which will maintain movement, um, and but that'll also prevent the muscles from building. So you could simply strength train your upper body. And then on leg day, your goal is to work on mobility, stability, flexibility. So you're still doing something, you're just not doing uh, any strength. Training. Yeah, I would do like body weight stuff, like these long, like walking lunges with like a balance in between. Like I do stuff like that, or multi planar lunges and and stuff like that, Cossack squats. Like I would do movements more like that, add a stability component uh, in there. Are you flexible? Mm -hmm. Uh, definitely could improve on that. Um, comes go. and goes, even, but yeah. Even static stretching is fine, especially if you're not going to do heavy strength training for your lower body. Mm -hmm. Like really focus on getting really flexible in the lower body. That'll help with movement um, and mm -hmm. in, in the mobility stuff. And then in the meantime, focus on heavy strength training for the upper body. So a routine may look like, how many days a week do you go to the gym? Uh, four to six, I would say, depending on uh, kind of, where I'm at in my program. I would do, you know, you could do three days a week of upper body, one day a week of lower body with core. And on the lower body day, it's like mm -hmm. mobility and stretching. Yeah. I mean, you could do something like that yeah. and give it time over time. You'll start to see things balance out. But I mean, I hear what you're saying. I'm reading your question. You're saying that the first time you ever squatted, you could rep 225. <laughs> the first time? <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, yeah. there are times when people just genetically, and yours is lower body. I knew a guy like this with his upper body, like with his, with his shoulders. He was just, just crazy. And mm -hmm. when you have this kind of genetics, like yeah. actually, in fact, I had, it, in fact, I had, in fact, I had, I had a female trainer with legs like this and she did long distance running and her legs grew. This is how sensitive her muscles. Same thing happened to me. Yeah. yeah so yeah. I like, thought endurance training would be the answer. A couple half marathons and still <laughs> they blew up. Yeah. Not surprised <laughs> that they grew, but <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I would do flexibility, mobility just to maintain movement. Cause you don't want to get, you know, you don't want to lose movement and mobility in your lower body. That yeah. would suck. And then yeah. just strength train your upper body and then give yourself some time. Give yourself mm -hmm. some time. Do maybe a slow reverse diet. You said you wrote down your body fat percentage is 16%. That's not bad. I would mm -hmm. maintain 16% slowly reverse diet so you can build in the upper yeah. body and give yourself like a couple years. Like try mm -hmm. to gain, you know, five to 10 pounds of lean body mass in your upper body to kind of yep. balance, you know, balance those things out. But I mean, I hear what you're saying. It sounds to me like you're just the the 0.1% of people, at least with your lower body, where it's just muscle fibers. Like they just, they just want to be. Yeah. Big. Yeah. yeah. Not a bad right. problem. Not a bad problem to have Riley, just to let you yeah. know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I knew that was, uh, you know, kind of the re the reverse chicken leg situation. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. feel like it's not, not something that but comes I, around but, very but, often, but. But I get it though. I mean, obviously if you feel like the, there's a huge difference between your lower and upper, I mean, I think most people would want uh, more symmetry there, but it is as simple as really backing off all of leg training. And the only thing you're really doing is addressing mobility and functionality, being good, able to move in different planes planes, good range of motion. So all body weight type of stuff. And, and you're really not training it hard at all. And then just getting hit in the upper body consistently. So, yeah, it's, yeah, man. He also squatted in the five hundreds in high school, bro. Two twenty five repping yeah. your first time. I can't yeah. even took me half my life to get to that. Dude. Adam can barely do that right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is hard for me, bro. It's, it's so crazy. But yeah, look up Tom Platt's. Tom okay. Platts um, uh, was like Branch Warren. Branch Warren is another bodybuilder. And, and if you saw him towards the end, you would never think that he was lower body dominant. But when he started as a bodybuilder, it was like, that's what he was known for. So I'll mm -hmm. give you three bodybuilders. Branch Warren, Tom Platts, Paul DeMeo. Paul DeMeo's passed away, but those three bodybuilders um, uh, all were known for having disproportionate lower bodies to upper bodies. But then towards the end mm -hmm. of their careers, became very balanced. And so you can find articles and stuff about, you know, interviews and stuff like that about yeah. how they balanced out their, and, and as bodybuilders, it's not like they wanted small legs. They just want to look balanced. You know, it's, it, yeah. it's, uh, 
I mean, it's, I have the opposite problem. My, my life, I had the small legs, but I had upper body developed. And so what my training has looked like for you know, most of my lifting career now is that I never miss a leg day. So in your case, I would mm -hmm. never miss upper body. Like, and so if I've taken a couple weeks off, even if the last thing I did was legs, I'm starting again on legs. So I'm always thinking that way. And that's kind of how you would be the yeah. reverse mentality is just like, Hey, you never miss that upper body training. And even if you took a time off and that was the last thing you did, you still start back up again with that. Yeah. And so in fact, do you have maps aesthetic. Yeah. Uh, I do not know. Okay. Here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna send you maps aesthetic and here's how I want you to modify it. I'm going to have you do maps aesthetic and on the foundational days, don't do the lower body exercises except for one of the days. And okay. even then, if you want, you could substitute the lower body exercises for just flexibility. So essentially what you're okay. doing is mostly, if not all upper body exercises on the foundational days. And then on mm -hmm. the focus session days, you could do target upper body exercises, isolation stuff. So it's going to be mostly gotcha. upper body type work. So I'll send that to you. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much. You got it, man. Thanks, All right. Yep. Thanks guys. I tell you <laughs> yes, what though. It's, it's like, okay. It's a, so, um, I have this massive dick and I don't know what to, <laughs> to, to do. <laughs> it's, it's, Pretty much. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. That's, that's it's why a, I could well, understand. Yeah. You know? yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it's funny because like. he didn't bring up the fact that like he played hockey for like years and <laughs> yeah, years. Like, dude. come on, dude. Like, you know how much uh, leg development Bro, like hockey players get? Like, they all, all that like contributes. That. 500 pounds in high school, in high school <laughs> repping 225 the first time you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. Have you guys ever seen there's a sprinter cyclist? For the Olympics? Yes. Have you ever seen these guys? Yes, dude. I mean, they shake their legs and they're like, <laughs> oh my God, it's yeah. like humans it's inside like each big, leg. Big, huge yeah. flesh. It's, but I mean, look, I get it because as a man, you know, you expect a woman to be lower body dominant, right? As if for a man, it's not, and you know, I hope I don't hurt his feelings, but it's not aesthetic. Well, You're, it's it's going to be common. more aesthetic to have a big upper body and a smaller lower body. That's not ideal either. But from an aesthetic standpoint, I understand what he's saying. It's like, because if you're a man and your legs are big and you look like a pear, right? Yeah. You're going to be insecure about that. But yeah. it'll take time. It's going to take well, them like two years. That's three the years. thing. Decades of playing, like, so a, you got to like put in perspective, like, how long of a period of just focusing exclusively on the upper body to kind of build and develop that to yep. even come close is going to take a while. Oh, it totally. felt, I felt like it was at least five years for me of consistently having that mentality of never missing legs, right? So, and, and still to this day, this is how I have to think right? Because I've put so much training volume into my upper body in comparison to my lower that if I am all falling off or inconsistent, I let arms and, and shoulders and stuff like that all the time I miss, but I don't miss legs. I got a squat. I got a deadlift. I got it. And so his, his, it's just a reverse mentality. It's just yeah. that over the course of the next five years, you yeah. never miss that just neurotic frequency. about your upper body. Yeah. yeah. And, and you know, Work. you should see that, that I'm pulling it up right now. I'm like, you look at like branch Warren when he won nationals versus when he won the, the Arnold classic. And you can see he really brought his upper body up because he was so lower. So you can, it can happen. It's just going to take time. Look, if you love the show, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out our guides. We have guides that can help you with almost any health or fitness goal. You can also find all of us on social media. So Justin is on Instagram, mind pump, Justin, Adam is on Instagram at MindPumpAdam. You can find me on Twitter at MindPumpSal. Today, we're going to teach you everything you need to know to build a strong, well-developed chest. When I think of you know, weak points and, and areas that I struggled with developing for a, a really long time, chest was up there with the- Yeah, it was for me. It was for me for sure. I got more caught up in the weight I could lift versus how I was developing my body. I think it's one of the most challenging muscles to develop for most people because the form and technique. 